Watch this fake. Good. Welcome to episode 39 of the Go Roadie podcast. Today I'm joined by one of the greatest Rams of all time, Tom Garrick. How are you, Tommy? I am, I am fabulous, Scott. I appreciate you taking the time uh, to include me in uh, on your podcast. Well, uh, you really are taking the time. You have a hectic schedule. I just want to fill our listeners and watchers in. You have uh, your associate head coach of the Vanderbilt women's team which is very impressive, by the way. Thank uh, you. And, and you have a four-year-old running around. I do, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't have much to do with her running around. She has boundless and endless energy. I just try to keep up with her. And the working at Vanderbilt is a little bit easier because my wife is the head coach. Yes, I know. We're going to get to that, too. And th another great side story. But here's a question for you. Who's a harder cover? Your daughter? Or maybe Sherman Douglas, Howard Evans, or anyone in the NBA that you had to cover? <laughs> Without a doubt, my daughter. I knew Without you were going to say daughter. that. Not okay. only is she just as quick as those guys, but she has the heart stream key on me. So whatever she wants, whatever she does, it's hard to stop her from doing. Well, I predicted that answer, but I would have been surprised of anything else. Yeah. Uh, but if you've lived in a cave and you don't know that Tommy was one of the great High school players at Rhode Island, a first time, a first team player, also won two championships, hit a buzzer beater, then went on to Rhode Island. You know, he had a great career. He was one of the whole team. I'm not going to say three or just yourself, because the way you talk about your teammates, it's a whole team package that took the team to the sweet 16. Some will say the final eight should have been. You lost by one to Duke. Yeah. And you yeah. had a great NBA career. You weren't there for a cup of coffee. You didn't sit on the bench. You were a part of the rotation. And uh, something to be very proud of, just making the NBA anyway. Uh, one of 5,000, according to Coutinho Mobley. I want to ask you a really key question here. Okay. I was a manager the three years. You were there for four years. For three years, do you remember me? And I'm not putting you on the spot. No. Um I remember a whole bunch about my time there at URI. And one of the things that is so important to the foundation of a program are the managers and the people who run the program on a daily basis. If I had to pick you out of a lineup, I would remember you. Right. Oh, no. Now, <laughs> no, seriously. I, but I don't want to be in a lineup, to... Tommy. Yeah, no, <laughs> nobody wants to be in a lineup. On a day-to-day -day basis, back then, I would say that I didn't appreciate you as much as I've come to understand I needed to. Um, so, yeah, I don't think we hung out a lot, but, yeah, I, I know who you are. Well, I was with this guy with a green Celtics jacket and very close. Brendan Malone has been a lifelong friend and mentor. And my yeah. job was to do the halftime shows to get people in the stands. And, you know, okay. it was hard during those first two years. Yeah. So I wasn't always there. And uh, but my re reason why you don't remember me is because you were so focused. Kenny's going to have a little sound bite later on. And in the practice, you were like in a zone, you know, no yeah. one could work you. And I don't think you saw much besides the court. That's just my take on it. So, no, I, I took that a lot of pride in that. I took a lot of pride in that, Scott. I, I appreciate you recognizing that or, 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 or saying that. And here's why. Uh, what a lot of people probably don't know, they just see the end. They don't see the process and the means to that end. I was not one of the more talented guys on those teams, even my senior year. I mean, I, I can fully admit that now. It's nothing to be ashamed of. I, I had to work as hard as I could and into my maximum potential 
just to be competitive. And I learned that going into my, uh, my freshman year in college because I had the opportunity to meet Silk Owens before our freshman season. He stayed at my house the summer before we uh, went to the University of Rhode Island as freshmen. And I got to see firsthand how far I had to go, how far behind I was. Silk was amazing, phenomenal. From the time he was 17 on, I wasn't. I was I was good. I, I, I worked really hard. I thought I was a decent basketball player amongst my friends and my colleagues at West Warwick High School, as you mentioned earlier. And we had some really good teams. I you couldn't tell me I wasn't a good basketball player, but it became very clear quickly to me that I had a lot of growth to do. And I took that very seriously. And then when I got to college, you're playing against six, nine people that I had never had the opportunity to play against on a consistent basis before that. I was playing against guys who were faster than me. I was playing against guys who were stronger than me. And that's kind of how I got my nickname. Um, Todd Bozeman and... Tony Tucker and Tony Taylor, guys who were older than me when we were <laughs> freshmen, right? Yeah. Um, they said I I would always have this stern look on my face and this mean look on my face when we were practicing and playing. And they likened it to a chief on a totem pole, a carved out wooden totem pole, because I always had this look on my face. And that's how I got the nickname Chief, because I was always so concentrated and focused on just keeping my head above water in those practices. Mm -hmm. Basketball has been a uh, key determinant in, in, in a lot of my life, as you well know. Um, like you said, you documented my life really well, and I appreciate that in the intro. I went on to play four years in uh, the NBA, the best league in the world. And sometimes I downplay that because it was only four years. I mean, everybody doesn't have a 20-year career like LeBron, but there's not a lot of guys who have – four-year careers either. I mean, a lot of guys don't make it. Um, a lot of guys who are better than me. And I think Catino put it best. And I learned that stat maybe two or three years ago. I'm one of a very small fraternity of people who have ever been allowed to put on a uniform and play a game in the National Basketball Association. There's only, like he said, there's only like 5,000 of us um, who have had that honor. Now, that number is going to grow over the years, but think of how long the NBA has been in existence. And to think that only 5,000 men have been able to play or call themselves NBA players. Man, that's a feather. And I'll take it. Just like Catino. Like that, that's something to be proud of, to be counted in that number. What about uh, a few weeks ago at the Ring of Honor? It, you feel like there's finally closure. Your number is retired. It's in the rafters. Does it, is it a feeling of relief or just recognition? We, yeah. we all really appreciate him being the uh, protagonist for making this happen. Um, it was an amazing event. It was an amazing night. I got to see people that I hadn't seen in close to 30 years. And it's that, that long ago, right? Yeah. And my teammates, most importantly, my teammates got the recognition that they deserve. It wasn't just a flash in the pan back in 1988. That's a lifelong thing. We will always be that team, that team that went the furthest the first time. Uh, the 98 team had gone further than us 10 years later, but we were that team. We, we followed the 78 team, right? That made it to the tournament and lost by one. And then we came in and we won a couple of games. So we'll always be that team. And I think that's the thing I'll appreciate the most. <laughs> And I will say this over and over again, and I've always said it. I am most happy for Silk and Kenny that their numbers go up in those rafters. I know what I deserve, and I know how hard I work to get it. But those guys were phenomenal players. I, I rode on Silk's coattails for four years. Um, I came up and helped him in the last two years. I, I'm proud of that. I, I got to a point where... I was on equal footing with him, and I was able to help lead that team. And then Kenny came a year after we got there as freshmen, and he was amazing. And he and Silk and I and John Evans and Bonzi Colson and Mergen Cena and Jimmy Christian and Dennis Tabus and Steve Lane and Josh Oppenheimer and 
David Burnsley and Andre Green and all of those guys who were on that team, and I hope I didn't miss anybody, um, even before that, the William Alstons. And uh, it's just these guys who were there during my tenure, it was an amazing time for us, and we grew up together, and we learned a lot about not only each other but the game of basketball and life in those four years. And I and they deserved this recognition. They deserved um, – some of us are, you know, numbers wise, some numbers will go up, some numbers won't. But I can say, and I know that Silk and Kenny feel the same way, that without all of the other guys that I just mentioned, our numbers don't go anywhere. We needed that team that was comprised and constructed the way that it was. The coaching change was important. But don't let it be mistaken that Brendan Malone wasn't a big part of us all having our numbers retired and that team going to the uh, Sweet 16 in 1988, he was a major part of it. Now, Tom Penders came in and took us to a whole nother level, um, but we were formed already. We didn't know how to win. We didn't know what it was like to go to that height, but we were formed as a, as a unit. And Tom Penders came and pointed us in the right direction, and we took off. So everybody gets credit, um, but those two people that – that I named Kenny and Silk. I'm so happy for them and so proud to be counted in their number. So I love basketball, mm -hmm. but I was a pretty good overall athlete. So football was my first love when I was a kid. I thought I was going to be a wide receiver in the NFL, like everybody else, uh, you know, so when I got the scholarship to play basketball at URI, I was all in as a basketball player, but my first two years were a little bit bumpy. I'd score 17 one day as a freshman, and then I wouldn't play the next game very much, and I'd score one. And that was all on me. I just wasn't at a level where Coach Malone could trust me every day, every game. But I worked really hard, right? So I kept at it. And then it turns into my sophomore year, and I get a little bit more time, but then I get a little bit of restricted time. And I just wasn't able to find consistency in my game enough to be trusted to play. And I started to lose a little bit of the luster and love that I had at that point. And URI football was really good at that time. They Tom were going Earhart. to Tom Earhart. They were going to championship games. It kind of creeped into my psyche somewhere during the end of my freshman season that, you know, maybe – I took the wrong road. Maybe I was supposed to go play football at URI and not basketball. And as I found them having saw them having success and me personally not having the kind of success that I hoped I would or that I thought I could, I thought maybe it was time to just end that dream and maybe begin another one. So I was in summer school, just like all the team. We would always go to summer school and work out together and lift and do all of those things to get prepared for the following season. Just one night I had an epiphany that I was going to walk down to the gym, walk into Coach Malone's office and just say, hey, I gave it all I could. This isn't working out for me. I know it's probably not working out for you as far as my development. And I'm just going to go play football. And I'm walking down the hill to the arena, uh, to Keeney Gymnasium. And as I'm walking in the front doors, a few of my teammates are walking out and they're like, chief, you wouldn't believe it. But coach Malone just resigned. He's going to the pros. He's going to coach it with the New York Knicks, I think was the story. And I took a pause. I wasn't probably as excited as I could have been or should have been. I was shocked that I was getting ready to go quit. And, but he had beaten me to it and resigned. And I just took that as a sign from the heavens above that maybe this was time to start a new chapter in my mind. Um, not tell anybody what I was about to do, but just go full bore ahead and see what the future was going to bring. And I'm so glad that I did. Well, Tommy, you know, this is a highly interactive show and I'm going to cut to one of your teammates right now. It's a sound bite. Coach Pendens came in. That's when uh, Tommy Garrett started to shine because he instilled that confidence in them. And uh, he already had the ability, but he had the coach made you believe that you can do it, you know. And not only Tommy, all of us. But Tommy really started to shine. And, you know, he went from 
you know, not playing as much to playing 39 minutes a game. If that's not confident, confidence, I don't know what is. How many thoughts? When Coach Prentice came in, the first meeting we had with him was on the track out behind Keeney Gymnasium at the field. Yeah. And we were doing our summer conditioning. And he got hired. And the first time, one of the first times we met him was on that track. And he walked up to us. He sat us down in the bleachers and he said, listen, he goes, I don't know any of you guys. I've worked, I've coached in New England my whole career. I've coached at Fordham. I've coached here. I've coached there. I don't know any of you guys. So none of you are really that good. Um, but the ones who work the hardest, the ones I can trust, the ones I believe in will be the ones who play. And that's all I needed to hear. That's all I needed to hear. And I believed him. I believed in what he said. And I believed that he was going to play the guys who worked the hardest and who were committed to doing what he asked them to do. Tom Penders sat me in that gym in Keeney gym one afternoon after a practice or a workout. And he looked me straight in my face and he said, listen, if you do these things, if you listen to me and you work hard, I will make you a pro. He said those words. There was no reason for me to have even thought about being a pro basketball player. Like, yeah, we all doodle in our notebook in high school and we practice our signature because we think we're going to be a pro. I think I'm going to be the next Dr. J or the next Andrew Tony, who were my favorite players uh, uh, when I was growing up. But there was no conceivable, rational notion that I would believe that. But every kid has pipe dreams, right? Every kid thinks that. I bought into what he was saying. I thought it will help me be the best player that I can be. Not until my senior year, the end of our senior season, did I even entertain the idea of actually being a pro. I think it was our final game of the season, our final home game, uh, senior night. Coach Penders called me and Silk up to the office uh, prior to our pregame warm-up, and he said, hey, listen, there's a couple of agents that want to talk to you guys uh, after the season's over. We think that you might have the opportunity to be drafted, maybe one or both of you. And my mind was blown. I was like, drafted? Agent? What are you talking about? He was like, yeah, I mean, you guys have had phenomenal seasons these last two years, and – they're going to take a look. You're going to get invited to a couple of camps and then see what that takes you. But you'll probably need an agent at some point. So I have a couple of people that I can offer to you to talk to. And that's the first time I really, really thought about it. Wow. I think he just said I might have the opportunity to play in the NBA if things fall correctly. And from then on, I, I changed my mindset to actually thinking that I could be a pro player. So my postseason workouts were harder than anything I had ever done to that point. And we did get invited to Portsmouth Invitational, um, which was kind of like this day's combine for NFL players. And, and from there, I get yeah. drafted. But you have to still perform, and even, and you did. You just – your performance at Portsmouth was just off the charts. So you don't get in the NBA by just getting invited there. You you ha and sometimes you don't. Your shot could be off, but from what you're you right. were saying, you were on. You're right. Like, I don't know how you. I don't. I don't know how you know that, and how you got that information. But you're exactly right. I I went down to Portsmouth and I put on a show. Determination to be. And a lot of it had to be a lot of it had to do with silk. Silk pushed Tommy. I mean really pushed Tommy. And it was almost to the point where Tommy didn't want to let Silk down. So I mean I truly believe Tommy said to himself, I've got to work harder than everybody else. And <laughs> when I say I've never seen a player Never get tired playing basketball. This kid was just an unbelievable athlete. Tommy could run. We do a two-hour practice. Like I said, he stay after. He's still doing drills 100% full out. I'm like, dude, you're not tired? No. And he would say, I don't have time to be tired. But just an unbelievable athlete. I mean, and 
take away everything that he did basketball wise. And I tell everybody that I talk to when they ask about our team and stuff like that. I said, I've never seen a guard in the kind of shape that this kid was in. That's pretty cool. I mean, to hear that and to know that my teammates thought that um, is pretty gratifying. Now, he and Silk both are right on the money. Like, I, I don't know what else I can add to that, but to say he's right. He was right. I w- now, I will say, not only didn't I want to let anybody down, and I alluded to this earlier, Silk Owens gave me the blueprint. I was able to see firsthand what I needed to do and how far I had to go. So this this young kid was right in front of me every day. And he was able to do things that I only could dream of doing on the basketball floor. But what I could do is run and I could jump and I could go longer than anybody else in my mind. Mm -hmm. I willed myself to do that. And even if I were tired, I wasn't going to let anybody else know. If I was tired, I wasn't going to let anybody know because my mom and dad told me a long time ago that You don't have to be the fastest. You just have to be faster than the person you're actually playing against. You don't have to be the strongest. You just have to be stronger than the guy you're playing against. You know what I mean? So I took that to heart. So I never let anybody know that I was tired for fear that I would be revealed, right? I played and I competed in my first two years, especially out of fear that people would realize this kid might not belong here. He might not be good enough. So I was like, I have to stand out somehow. So, and I don't know. I I can't remember. One of those guys could probably say it differently, but I don't remember losing many sprints in you college. Didn't lose any, Tommy? I was there. I don't remember I losing that. Any if I lost any, so I mean, and you you were in practice. You, at yeah. College practice. You you sprint every day. There's some form in some segment in practice where coach puts you on the line, and it's not punishment. It's just for conditioning, like up and back, get a drink. Okay. Up and back, down and back four times, five times. We used to have these things called full court fives where you go up and back and that's one. So you have to do that five times. I mean, every college has their own um, iteration of, of conditioning. Against Irving. What a job. Staying zone. Green putting it down. All of them coming since 1972, and all of them under Norm Stewart. It's there. Gary. Shoots for the lead. It's there. Get the sociology and begin to talk to the media. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. It's there. That's Kevin. Kevin had one of the ball since. Gary. Uh, he's got the best record of the 40s decade. Won 178 and losing with 44. It's man for man. Owen. Gary. He put him back. It's down two with six even to go. Gary. So, okay. Okay. I had yeah, to stop cool somewhere. Stuff. Before it was famous to break ankles, you did that. Did you know yep. that meant anything at that time? It, because I didn't know that it meant anything. I just saw it as a, a nice <laughs> shot. No, that's a new evolution of the game. Back then, it didn't mean anything. It just meant that I had time to prep myself and get balanced for a shot. Like, I, nobody, we didn't even talk about that kid hitting the floor. And that was, his name was Byron Irvin, and he was a really good player out of Chicago. Yeah. I think he went on uh, maybe play in the NBA for a year or two. I'm not sure about Byron's career. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that Missouri team was very, very good. Um, and we took it to him. What you see, and what's funny, is that all the shots you have me making are at the right end of the court in front of our bench. And that's because I didn't make any shots in the first half. Um, Silk had a f- great eight. first half. He had maybe 20 in the first half. I remember that. He carried us. And I just I couldn't get it going in the first half. It's not because I I lacked for shot opportunities because Silk and I, we were going to shoot. That was determined from the time Coach Penders took over. He's like, you two are going to lead us. You're going to be the catalyst for our offense. You're going to shoot the ball as many times as you feel you have to to help us win. So Silk and I knew that. And much credit to the rest of the team. They understood that also, and there was not ever really any complaining. 
So my shot just wasn't falling in the first half. So we fed Silk a lot. But in the second half, I came out and I got it rolling. And I think we both ended up with mid-20s in that game. Um, but he did all of his work in the first half and I did all of my work in the second half. And we just – there was never a – there was never a chance. You know, I can say this now and it seems, you know, a little egotistical, but it's not. There was never a chance that Missouri was going to beat us. Not, not one. And you can ask any guy on our team going into that game. We didn't think it was what a 6 11 or a 5 11 matchup or whatever that is. There was never a time that we thought Missouri was better than us or that they could compete with us. And it was a, we, we didn't think we were going to beat them by 40 or anything. But we just had this inner confidence that you know, we didn't come down to Carolina to lose. So they're in for a big surprise if they think because we're the 11th seed that we're going to lose this game. And that's the way we played from top to bottom, from beginning to end. Coach Pendos had us riled up and we were ready to go win that game. Yeah. And uh, another thing to think about was you were one for eight in the first half and that nine for 13 in the second half. So mm -hmm. You think about a player like John Starks in the 1994 uh, finals against Houston mm -hmm. Game 7. Yeah. He was yeah. probably one for eight in the first half, too, and he kept shooting, and he kept didn't shooting. get shots, and, and that happens all the time. But it does. you willed it in, nine for 13, and you, you kept on going because you believed in yourself. So it's just it makes it extra special that not only did you continue to shoot, but the balls went in. Yeah, it, it's 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 a funny thing. Confidence it can come and go now. It it can leave you if if you, if you're not paying attention. Um, I remember there's an audio soundbite on one of the shots that I didn't make at the beginning of the second half, and you can hear Coach Penders go, "Garrick, come on!" Yeah. Basically, like, hey man, we need you to get off the snide. Like we need you to start making these. And it wasn't pressure. It wasn't. It wasn't like he was yelling at me. He was yelling for me. He was yelling with me. And that's what Tom Penders did. Even when you got in trouble for doing something wrong on the court, it wasn't a chastisement. It was an encouragement that you're better than that. And we need you to be better than that for us to win. And it just made you want to do it. It made you like just like you said with John Starks, John Starks kept shooting because that's what he was meant to do for that Knicks team. I had to keep shooting and my shots fell. And I don't think for one second that John didn't think that his were going to fall. Right. Yeah. It just so happens. And everybody talks about that game. It's funny. You mentioned that it's like, they call it the John Starks game. If he didn't keep <laughs> yeah. shooting, maybe they win. Well, no, if he doesn't keep shooting, they have no chance. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's one of those things. And that's how I felt. If I don't keep shooting, I let my team down, and I'm not going to let my team down. Well, there's so many games like that. The uh, Virginia Commonwealth game this year, their star player yeah. uh, on the team, uh, Ace Baldwin, was missing in the first half and was missing in the second half. Now, they did lose the game, but if there was no second half, uh, Tom Garrick's second half, then that story goes on. You just yeah. Some days you just don't have it with you. You had it in the second half, and that's not an easy thing to do when you've you've gone one for eight. Right. Well, I appreciate that, uh, but it but it is exponentially easier when you have the belief and confidence of a whole bunch of people and a whole team behind you. Like, I shot one for eight in the second half. Nobody stopped giving me the ball in the second in this in this in the second half. Right. I shot one for eight in the first half. Nobody stopped giving me the ball. Nobody said, "Chief, yo, pass it." No, they were like, "Shoot it, dude, shoot." The ball, Kenny, Bonzi, Mergen, John Evans, Silk. Hey, man, come on. We're coming right back to you. And when you have teammates who are that supportive, it's hard not to have confidence in yourself. Were you the best player in high school? And I know the, the person who won was, I believe, Steve Williams. Steve Williams, yeah. Yeah. Were you better than him? or I was. And I, and I can say that with all humility. Like, mm -hmm. Steve was a great two-sport athlete. He went on to play uh, football at Boston College as a defensive back. They used to call Steve Williams speedy because he was so fast. Now, Steve Williams was a much better football player than I was. I told you football was my favorite sport. 
Yes. Ironically, we ended up beating Steve Williams and Bishop Hendrick in high school my senior year for the state championship in football. He was a better football player, but we had a better team. But I was a much better basketball player. Steve, even at that time, I, I, I don't think Steve would say much differently. Well, we're on the Duke game, and this is something that I don't think was brought up to you. It was a New York Times article, and they thought Duke won the game because Krzyzewski had a, a great defense that addressed the speed that you had, and they took you and Silk out of the game. I don't believe that's, I think the foul, phantom fouls was the problem. Do you think there's any truth to what he was saying, the, the writer of the Times, on his the defense that Duke had with you? I think it was a zone type of defense that slowed you. Yeah, no, no. It was, it, Duke had a great defense. They were good. They had a really good team. Uh, but I think we were a better team. And had I not gotten into foul trouble, which I take full responsibility for, I got three fouls in the first 10 minutes of the game or less. See it right here, Tommy? Yep. Three fouls with 13 minutes. and It was even worse. Yeah. First so half. I felt that one of the fouls was logical. One of the fouls was a definite foul. The mm-hmm. other foul was questionable. The third foul, absolutely not. The third foul was an and one, and I picked up a foul on Quinn Snyder. Mm -hmm. What they were doing was nothing tricky or special. They had good defenders. And Quinn Snyder would strip the ball as you were going up. He stripped me one time when I was going for a shot. And then I adapted to it. And the second time he tried to strip me, he reached. I leaned in. It was we were playing today, it would definitely have been an and one. I don't know why it wasn't an and one back then, but he reached, I dipped my shoulder, I created space, and I went up and made a shot. And the referee, I remember him running. We both fell. And I remember him running towards us. And I'm like, man, okay, now I now I'm into it. I've made one of my first few shots. I'm feeling good. I'm getting ready to go to the line, make this foul shot. And he's pointing at me, and I'm like, why are you pointing at me? I am the – yeah, I got fouled. I'm going to the line. And then he put his hand behind his head, and I remember just sitting there staring at him and thinking, there's no way in the world you just called not only an offensive foul on me, but my third foul. And I looked up at the clock, and there were 13 minutes to go, and I was like, well, I guess I just have to make an adjustment. But what it did was for about a 10-minute span – it, it, it stifled my aggressiveness. And if I was one thing on the floor at all times, I was always aggressive. And it made yeah. me change my offensive aggressiveness. Uh, and also, I was a pretty good defender. It made me back up on defense. But that didn't hurt us as much as me not being aggressive offensively did. I don't – I think reporters have to have a story. And at that time – their defense, Duke's defense was a burgeoning thing with the slapping of the floor. We were like, yeah, we're going to make you slap the floor a whole lot because you're going to need it in our minds. Um, but the story in the Times about them having this special defense and them taking the guards out, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. Tommy, what happened? You didn't go to your own party. The, no. I, I you were a wall on your draft party. Tell us about that. I was a little too nervous to be around um, on that day. One of the things that has always driven me in any endeavor, um, athletic, social, academic, is I never wanted to embarrass my parents, right? I, I just had such an affinity and a love for my family that I never wanted to be seen as an embarrassment. So as that day drew closer and nearer, and as the day finally came upon us, my family was gathered and some family friends were at the house and it just, the weight of what was about to happen or what could potentially happen clearly rested right on my shoulders and it hadn't prior to that. So as we're sitting around and eating and enjoying each other and having a fun time watching TV or telling stories, I was like, what happens if the phone doesn't ring? That would be pretty embarrassing. And as that feeling washed over me, I did not want to be in that room anymore. I did not want to be in my house. I did not want to be a part of 
the potential embarrassment, not to myself, but to my parents. And it was all made up in my head that my parents weren't going to be embarrassed. They were so proud of me and so happy for me and loved me so much that just being there in that moment was enough for them. But I called one of my friends. I snuck to a phone in my house. I called one of my friends, Matthew Lombardo, who I grew up with in West Warwick. And I said, hey, Matt, why don't you come to my house and pick me up and we'll go for a ride? She was like, all right, yeah, I'm not doing anything. So I walked out the back door of my house and I didn't come back for like an hour and a half. In that time, we rode around West Warwick, which is, it takes about 10 minutes to ride around West Warwick. We rode around for a half hour. We stopped at a yeah. court, shoot some baskets, stopped to get something to drink, go to Dell's Lemonade. We did a whole bunch of stuff in an hour and a half, right? Yeah. So by the time I get back to my house, my mother, I walk in the front door and my family is like, my mom and dad, where, where have you been? You, you missed a really important call. <laughs> so at that point, I kind of downplayed. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, who called? And they're like, we're going to give you the number. It's a Mr. Elgin Baylor from the Los Angeles Clippers. You need to call him right back right now. So the story goes, I called Elgin Baylor back. And he tells me that I've been drafted by the Los Angeles Clippers and that training camp starts on such and such a day. And they're going to send me a ticket. And he's excited to meet me and see me and have me potentially be part of his organization so but i was never there for the call well this is possibly the biggest story of your career your dad and uh he was blinded in 1944 he met your mom he got married he never saw your mom nope you you grew up you didn't even know he was visually impaired until you're five years old right your brothers were I think they were just as excited. He was just as excited to have them give the play-by-play -play as watching you because he just was such a family man. Let's talk about your dad. What defines you, and I think that's what kept you so centered, is that who you are, and, and you're the son of your parents, your dad and your mom. 100%. Um, I am nothing without my mom and dad. Um, I'm the youngest of eight children. Like you said, my father was, uh, I'll recap the story. My father was blinded in World War II. He met my mom in the hospital when he was recuperating. Uh, had eight children, never saw my mom, never saw any of us visually, but he saw into our soul. Um, and he knew exactly who we were and who we were as a family, but he knew exactly who we were as individuals. I could not have done better in the way of being born into the Garrett clan than anything else in the world. Um, it is like the tournament is one shining moment. Mm -hmm. That is my one shining moment for my life is being the son of Thomas and Beatrice Garrick. They, everything that I am, they've instilled in me, um, not just athletically, but as a person, as a human being, there's not one person that I could ever find who could say a bad word about either my mom or my dad. Just somebody asked me in the recent past, um, what stood out most about my childhood? And it's growing up and seeing how well-respected my parents were in every aspect of their lives. At my school, at my church, in society, there was never a time where I was with either my mom or my dad or both of them in a social setting that they didn't command a room and not because they were flamboyant or loud or flashy. It was because of their integrity. People respected my mom and dad because my mom and dad did what they said and they meant what they did, right? They, they just were class personified in my mind and they always have been, and they will always be the two most important people in my life because they put me on a path that if I was going to follow would lead me to success. Now, there's no guarantees in life. I have children now. I have three children, and I know it's a daily grind. It's a daily grind. There's, I, I live in Na Nashville now because I work at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. In a mile from my house yesterday, there was a school shooting oh, at, a, yes. at a preschool. And wow. my daughter is four years old. She doesn't go to that school, but it's a mile from our house. And she well could have gone to that school as for a preschool student. 
And I am blessed every day thinking that the, the stories and the lessons that my mom and dad led me to understand, the most important of those being consistent, being consistent. Um, I alluded to the Nashville thing every day or yesterday in, 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 in saying that we all need to be appreciative every day of what we have, of where we are. And that goes to my mom and dad because my mom and dad were there every day. They never took a day off from being my parent. And you just never know from day to day whether you're going to have that opportunity. So you, you, you think about it logically. You can't take a day off. Tomorrow's not promised to you. And that was made clear to me by my parents. Um, it's how I coach now, right? Coaching is parenting in an extended form. These parents entrust their children to their coaches for four years and to help shepherd them into the next phases of their lives. And I take that very seriously because of my mom and dad, because of what they did for me and all of my siblings. They were the most consistent people in my life. And that's good and bad. Take out the garbage. Make your bed. Why are your grades not where they're supposed to be? Not just, hey, you're great. Hey, you're fabulous. You're my son and nothing else you do is wrong. No, it was never that. Yeah. It was, you're going to hold yourself to this standard that we set forth for you because you deserve it, because you earned it, because you don't know it yet, but you're going to need this going forward. You're going to need me to be on your back about the little things that you don't think are important, but that you're going to come to learn very quickly are very important. And I had the pleasure of learning that every day. I didn't have to be shown how to work hard at URI because I saw my father get up every morning and work around our house. So my father had a job up until maybe I was four years old before he retired. So he got out of rehab um, in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, where he met my mom, went up to New York to do rehab as a blinded veteran and earned his way to North Kingstown, Rhode Island at the Naval base where he worked on fighter plane radars. The broken radars that were in the fighter jets, he -hmm. worked on those to rehab those and reinstall those. So my father worked every day of his life, right? Up until I was maybe five years old. So that's a long time since I'm the youngest of eight and my brother's 18 years older than me. But I knew what it was like to put in a hard day's work. And my mom worked equally as hard as he did raising eight children and being responsible um, to help a blind person get around. Like my father was the most independent person I know, but he did need some help. He couldn't drive. My mom had to drive him everywhere. My mom made every meal for our family. So my mom worked just as hard as my dad. But seeing those two people in action on a daily basis and having it be commonplace, like it didn't seem like it was anything special until I got to be an adult. And I realized, oh, man, those two people really, really brought it every day. And me having three children and how hard it is to raise three children, never mind raising eight and having someone in the house who was visually handicapped. And I had to think about how to say that because my father was not handicapped. My father didn't know what the word handicap meant. Like he didn't have sight, but he, okay, this is my lot in life right now. How do I best operate with this as my dilemma? And he did that. My father, when I was 10 years old, he changed an engine in our car. Like he took an engine out of our station wagon and put another engine in, in our driveway by himself. Like that's, you, I don't know how to change oil in a car right now. Never mind putting in an engine. And he did that. So I saw stuff like that on a daily basis. I saw my mom make magic in the house every day with a meal or keeping the house clean or keeping the schedule right. I grew up in West Warwick, Rhode Island, in a house with one bathroom and seven women. Right. <laughs> Just, wow. I, and, it, and it didn't seem like a big deal. Like we have three bathrooms in my house right now. And I have my wife and my four year old and I can't keep that clean. So, I mean, it's just the, the simple pleasures of life that I took for granted from 
being born to 18 years old when I finally got out on my own and I had to go live in a dorm at URI and keep it clean and mm-hmm. do my own laundry. I had been doing that since I was 13 years old because there was too many of us in the house for a mom to do everything. So up until the point where she had to do everything for us, she made us responsible for helping take care of each other. So I learned how to do my laundry when I was seven years old. Now, did I have to always do it by myself? No, of course not. I had seven other siblings who took their turn, but I knew how to do it. I knew how to make a meal for myself by the time I was eight or nine. Did I have to do it? No. My mom was like, stay out of my kitchen. But in the event that you do need to make this, here's how I'm doing it. Whether it be a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, toast, waffles, whatever. So those two people instilled in me such a sense of pride that carrying the Jack Garrick name is the most important thing that I ever do in life. Yeah. And now we have a situation where people can have fits when the Wi-Fi is down. Right. Yeah. Unbelievable. There's bigger things going on. Yeah. Well, we're looking at the difference between your freshman and sophomore year and your junior and senior year. And we go over to these two slides and then over here, this chart. Wow. Look at that. I haven't yeah. seen this. Uh, I hadn't seen this either. It's quite a jump, isn't it? The numbers well, I, speak for themselves. And I just haven't seen players that made that massive jump from 6.6 to 17. Yeah. It, no, that that that's um, – yeah, I, and I credit – I give credit to my coaches and my teammates because you don't you don't make that kind of jump on your own. I, I put in the – I'll tell you, Scott, I – and I don't say this in a cocky way, and I, I hope nothing that I've said today comes across in a cocky way, but Our in a way of, I've I've come to my I've come to the revelation that it's okay to say that I worked hard. It's okay to say what the numbers actually tell you. Like I I I had to come a long way to get those numbers. And I don't make that jump without <clears throat> Bonzi Colton setting screens for me. I don't make that jump without Kenny Green occupying four people in the paint because he was so amazing. I don't make that jump without half the team paying half the opponent opposing team paying attention to Silk Owens, because no matter what you did, he was going to get his 19 to 20 John Evans running the wing, Jimmy Christian being a fabulous shooter. uh, Rick Blevins being a shooter. Again, we can go on and on with the names, but my teammates are a really integral part of that ascension for me. But you still have to make the jump shot, Tommy. I do. And I worked really hard to try to do that. They would just leave you open and concentrate on others, which has happened this last season uh, in a growing year. Yeah. How did you get your start in women's coaching? So after I played in uh, my last stint overseas was in Turkey. So I played overseas for five years after leaving the NBA which led to a nine-year professional career, which I'm really, really proud of, right? So I played in Turkey my last year in Europe, and then I came back, and my son Thomas was turning five years old. And he wasn't able – they weren't able to go. My daughter Ryan was seven years older than Tom, and they weren't able to go with me overseas all the time because there wasn't a corresponding military base that they could go to school, that they could attend school. So I was really tired of missing a lot of my children's developmental years in in elementary school and preschool. So when Thomas was getting ready to begin to kindergarten, I decided that, you know what? It's been nine years. I've had a good run. My knees aren't really great anymore. My back hurts most mornings. Maybe it's time for me to come back home and transition into my next phase of life. So when I did that, there was an opening at the University of Rhode Island on Jim Harrick's staff. They had just gone to the Elite Eight the year before. I come back home. Somebody mentions to me that, hey, Coach Harrick might have an opening. You should talk to him. So I make a call or two. Uh, John Vanner, one of the associate athletic directors at URI at the time, was a very important part of this. I make a call. He sets up a meeting. All good. Coach uh, Coach Herrick gives me a call and says, hey, why don't you come to my house in East Greenwich and meet with me? I put on my best suit, 
my best tie, my nicest shoes. I go to Coach Herrick's house. He opens the door. And if anybody is familiar with Coach Jim Herrick, he's one of the nicest individuals, nicest people I've ever met in my life in this coaching business. And he opens the door and he has a polo shirt on, shorts and sneakers. And he was like, well, hi, Tommy. I don't know why you're so dressed up, son. You got the job. (laughs) <laughs> and it was the funniest thing. And it was the most appropriate way for me to meet Coach Herrick. He's like, you look really good, man, but you didn't have to come dressed up. You got the job, son. And we had about a three-hour talk about what I wanted to do and what he needed from me and what direction this could take for me. And he was anything short of Coach Penders and Coach Al Skinner. He was the best person for me to apprentice with that my first year. It The way he worked the team, the way he got the best out of people, the way he was able to show people what he wanted them to do and what he needed from them, it was amazing. So I had the best first year of coaching. So I worked three years on the men's side. Coach Herrick went to Georgia. One of the assistants on that team, Jerry DiGregorio, gets the head coaching job at URI. I stay on. So I'm on the bench for two years as an assistant, three years as an assistant with the men. Coach DiGregorio resigns, so now I'm without a job. But the head coach of the women at the time, the URI women's basketball program, Bo Peerman, and I had become friendly. Uh, I would go on her practices. I'd watch because she was a really good coach, and I just wanted to learn as much about coaching as I could. So after our practices, in between me proctoring study hall, I would go in and watch the women practice sometime. And she would ask me questions or about my career and what did I think about what she was doing and how it differed from the men's game. And she was doing some really good, phenomenal stuff too. And I was like, I don't know how you think it differs, but some of the stuff you're doing is better than some of the stuff that is happening on the men's side. So we formed a a friendship. And once she realized that I was out of a job, she asked if I would come on and coach with her until I found another spot on the men's side. She goes, I know it's going to be temporary. I know you want to be a coach on the men's side. And I've been coaching women's basketball ever since. So I really appreciate and uh, have a debt of gratitude to Bo Peerman for offering me the opportunity to be an assistant on her bench. From there, I went on to uh, coach at the University of Virginia for maybe a couple of months. (laughs) I was at Virginia for a couple of months before Tom McElroy, the newly appointed AD at the time for URI, called me asked me what I thought um, the URI women needed in in the way of a coach. He wanted an inside look into the program. So I told him everything I knew from my three years coaching with Coach Pierman. Long story short, I get the job at Virginia. I'm down there for two months. And Tom McElroy calls me. He's like, hey, listen, I really appreciate the time you took to tell me about what you thought the URI women's program needed and he goes i've done an exhaustive search for the last two months but i haven't found the right candidate and i think that's because i think you're the right candidate so he offered me the job on the spot and i took it and that long winding road has led me here to coaching with my wife at vanderbilt again as the associate head coach and we're doing it as a family and it's one of the things i'm most proud of in my coaching profession is that this long road has gotten me here to where I can coach at this level at a great university uh, alongside my wife. Wow. That's just a great story, uh, especially <laughs> your story now coaching with your wife as associate coach. And and she was one heck of a player. Shea Ralph is an amazing basketball player. She's an m- amazing coach, uh, but an even better mom and wife. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't ask for more in where I'm at right now with my coaching profession and my personal life. Well, I had more questions, but you hit on some of them already. Uh, The only one I wanted to talk about was how you practice your signature in seventh grade because you, I thought that was a very cool. I have, I have full notebook pages at the back of a lot of my subject notebooks, be it English, math, science full pages of my signature written over and over it hundreds, hundreds of times, just in the idea that I was going to be a professional athlete. 
football, basketball, I was like, at some point, and you hear these stories all the time. My, yeah. I, I'm no different. And it's true. I bet you at some place back in West Warwick in my mom's house, there's a notebook that she saved that I've been practicing my signature in. And I just believed that I was going to be something special. And what did you call it? There's a name for that. What's I'll, that? I'll, what you did, that exercise of signing your name. Practice? Um, irrational confidence. Irra that's true. That is right. <laughs> I do I'm believe in use that. I, I, think I that do believe in irrational confidence. And I think every professional athlete has, you believe that you're capable of things that no one else understands or believes that you can do. And you can do it a lot. You, you, if you think it into existence, but you have to have a rational confidence. I tell my players that now all the time. But now here's the trick, Scott. Yeah. To have a rational confidence, you have to put in the work. You can't just say, I believe. I have a rational confidence. Yeah. There was a lot of days like I just alluded to in Southside Boys Club that led me to my rational confidence. There was a lot of days in West Warwick High School Gymnasium that led me to my irrational confidence. There was a lot of days in Keeney Gym out on that field in the back that led me to my irrational confidence. Those days that Kenny Green talked about that I would run longer than anybody else. That's what I was building. Irrational confidence. Here's another question, a memory question. Who had the ugliest shot on the team? Who had the ugliest shot on the team? Yeah. Who had the ugliest outside shot? Probably John Evans. Well, Silk Owens used to, Tommy used to say, Silk, you have the ugliest shot. <laughs> Silk's <laughs> arm was bent because oh, yeah. he had a board in it, but the end of his shot was sublime. And yeah, I he just did that though. He said that to him because that's Tom Penders. And uh, yeah. Silk owned it. He's not embarrassed about it, but uh no, not at all. And that drove Silk to shoot that shot more and more and more. And that's what Coach Penders knew. Yeah. And one more, there was a celebrity that Tom Penders looked like, and when you guys were on the bus. They refer to him. Do you know the celebrity? These are tough questions. Yeah, I do not. Uh, Gene Wilder. Yes, that's true. Yeah. yeah, I can see it now. I'm a movie guy, so it would have taken me a minute to get it. But I was thinking of current people, which I don't know why I was thinking of yeah. current people. But Gene Wilder does make sense. Yeah. And so gave me that one. And how did Tommy Penders have the tan he had? And I didn't know there was that much sun in... Uh, Kingston in February. I'm stunned by that and stumped by that to this day. I I, I do not know, but yeah. Coach Penders, he was just a cool guy, man. He really was. Not only was he confident, borderline cocky, but not. Um, and he instilled that in us. But he just always looked apart too. So it, it was almost like when people are that confident in what they tell you, it's hard not to believe them. And he was that guy for us. It was hard not to believe everything that he was saying to us. And we believed it. Well, Tommy, we learned so much today. More. I didn't think I could pick any more out of you, but you gave well, me I appreciate, a story. I appreciate you taking the time, man. It's really important uh, to me and my teammates that um, we're being recognized for some of the work that we put in. We're grateful. We're thankful. And we're very appreciative. And uh, I hate to do this part of it, but I want our listeners to subscribe because and hit the, the bell. Because if you don't, you won't see guests like Tommy Garrick, who's a legend. I think you're a top five. Patino will argue maybe he'll he's in the top five. You're five or six. And um, the other thing is, when's this book deal going? I'm going to write the book. Who's better yeah, to write yeah, the book for I you? I think it would make it a good work. one. I think it would make a good one. Maybe I'll start to think about that. You have a separate a extra room in your house where I could just uh, a closet or something. <laughs> well, well, great, Tommy. Uh, I'm going to just close on what, I, however, I always close when it comes to roadie basketball. It's always go roadie. Go roadie. I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. You never disappoint. Good luck with Bandy. And thank you very much. Blessing, I appreciate that. It's a blessing. Most importantly, that your daughter is fine and healthy. It most, it most certainly is. And I mean, this is not, I don't know if this is a forum to say it, but we have to do better as a society. Um, the, the, the angst I felt yesterday living in Nashville with a four-year-old daughter, no one should ever have to feel. And I know we've had so many that 
it's I think our society has become numb and we can't uh, become numb to this stuff. Uvalde, Nashville, all of these places, we, we have to do better. We have to figure this out. We have to do better because no one no one should have to feel the way the people in Nashville have felt yesterday and the way that far too many people in our country have felt over the past 10 years. I couldn't agree more. Have a great day, Tommy. And Thank you. You too, Scott. Get back to work. All right, man. Take <laughs> yeah. care. Thank Take you. Take care. Thank you.